on World News Tonight. Election run. Brazil's Lula and Bolsonaro race runoff after a surprisingly tight result. Search and rescue. Carolinas face a disaster recovery expected to cost tens of billions of dollars after Ian. Tesla bot unveiled. Elon Musk unveils humanoid Optimus robot at Tesla's AI day. And sequins and sparkle. Sheer fabrics festooned with sequins featured at the Valentino Spring and Summer 2023 show. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Deeply divided Brazil will hold a deciding vote in four weeks time after far-right incumbent Jair Bolsonaro performed more strongly than expected in Sunday's presidential poll. With 99.9% of voting machines counted, left-wing Chancellor Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva had 48.4% of valid votes compared with 43.3% for Bolsonaro. Supporters of Lula da Silva celebrated after voting showed the leftist workers' party had beaten incumbent Jair Bolsonaro in the first round of Brazil's presidential election. Lula received more than 48% of the votes, while Bolsonaro received 43%. It now means they'll go head-to-head -head in a second round at the end of the month. E eu sempre achei... I always believe that we'll win these elections, and what I can tell you is that we're going to win these elections. This is just extra time for us. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro says he's done better than the pollsters and analysts thought he would. Polls suggested Bolsonaro was close to losing the battle in the first round. I think we'll form a good alliance to win the elections. Despite building a devoted base of supporters, Bolsonaro's administration has been marked by incendiary speech, criticized over his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and having the worst deforestation in the Amazon rainforest in the last 15 years. Lula is credited with building an extensive social welfare program which helped lift tens of millions of people out of poverty. Despite his administration's involvement in vast corruption scandals. Ukraine claimed full control of the eastern logistics hub of Lyman, Kiev's most significant battlefield gain in weeks. Meanwhile, constitutional courts in Russia have ruled that the most recently announced annexations are in fact lawful. Russian flags were being taken down in the town of Lyman, according to footage posted by a Ukrainian official, after Kiev on Sunday claimed full control of the eastern logistics hub. This is Ukraine's most significant battlefield gain in weeks. It provides a potential staging post for attacks to the east while heaping further pressure on the Kremlin. In a short video released on Sunday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked soldiers as he said Liman was fully cleared. Russia's defense ministry said on Saturday that it was pulling troops out of the area, quote, in connection with the creation of a threat of encirclement. Moscow's forces had captured Liman in May and used it as a logistics and transport hub for its operations in the north of the Donetsk region. The stinging setback for Russian President Vladimir Putin comes after he proclaimed the annexation of four regions on Friday, an area that includes Liman. Russia moved to annex these regions after holding what it called referendums, votes that were denounced by Kyiv and Western governments as illegal and coercive. It's been four days after the storm hit Florida, but rescuers are still struggling to search for survivors and stranded residents. The remnants of Hurricane Ian drifted through Virginia on Sunday while storm-ravaged residents in Florida and the Carolinas faced a disaster recovery expected to cost tens of billions of dollars. Ricky Anderson is a displaced Sanibel Island, Florida resident staying in Fort Myers. Just moved down June 15th or June 1st, and I was down getting the house ready and everything, and 
here come the hurricane and I had to evacuate and everything and now I've lost everything. All everything, my life savings, everything, my tools, everything. I mean, you look around here, there's nothing. We have no power, no phone service, nothing. So we just like a little help. I'd like a little help to get my home back in shape because I have nowhere to go. Aerial footage showed Sanibel Island, home to some 6,000 residents, was left utterly devastated. The storm's death toll was expected to rise as floodwaters receded and search teams pushed farther into areas initially cut off from the outside world where hundreds of people have been rescued. More than 50 storm-related deaths have been confirmed since Ian hit Florida's Gulf Coast with catastrophic force last week. Florida accounted for the bulk of the fatalities, with 42 tallied by the sheriff's office in coastal Lee County, which bore the brunt of the storm when it made landfall. Eleven other deaths have been reported by state officials in four neighboring counties. North Carolina authorities said at least four people had been killed there, while no deaths were immediately reported in South Carolina, where Ian made another U.S. landfall on Friday. The White House said President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden will see the devastation in Florida firsthand on Wednesday. The Bidens will visit Puerto Rico on Monday, where hundreds of thousands of people were still without power two weeks after Hurricane Fiona hit the island. A stampede at a soccer stadium in Indonesia killed 125 people and injured more than 320 after police fired tear gas to clear the crowd on the pitch. The use of tear gas is now the subject of the investigation of FIFA has banned its use to all soccer stadiums. The Premier League in Indonesia will be suspended while a full investigation takes place. 125 people have been killed in a crush and riot at a soccer match in Indonesia, officials said on Sunday. It is one of the world's worst ever stadium disasters. The tragedy unfolded on Saturday in Malang, in the province of East Java, after home side Arema FC lost 3-2 to Persebaya Surabaya. East Java police chief Nico Afinta said frustrated Arema supporters invaded the pitch. Officers responded by firing tear gas in an attempt to control the situation, triggering the crush and cases of suffocation. A printer claimed officers had been attacked and cars damaged, and said the crush happened when fans fled for an exit gate. 180 were also injured. Among them was 22-year-old Mohamed Rian Dwikiono, who said many friends had lost their lives because of officers who dehumanized us. The head of one of the hospitals in the area treating patients told Metro TV that some of the victims had sustained brain injuries and that the fatalities included a five-year-old child. On Sunday, Malang residents gathered outside the stadium to lay flowers. Indonesia's president, Joko Widodo, has ordered the Football Association of Indonesia to suspend all games in the top league until an investigation has been completed. World Soccer's governing body FIFA has requested a report on the incident from Indonesia's PSSI Soccer Association. In its safety regulations, FIFA specifies that no firearms or crowd control gas should be carried or used by stewards or police. East Java police did not immediately respond to a request for comment on whether they were aware of such regulations. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Burkina Faso's overthrown military chief agreed to step down two days after army officers announced his deposition in the country's second coup in a year. The African Union has demanded the return of constitutional order by July 2023 at the latest, agreeing with the regional group Economic Community of West African states that the ousting of leader Damiba was unconstitutional. <laughs> Ouagadougou is a city on edge after Burkina Faso's coup on Friday. But on Sunday, the West African country's new self-declared leader, Captain Ibrahim Traore, said the situation was under control. In a statement read on television by an army officer, with Traore standing alongside, 
order was said to be being restored. On Saturday, with gunfire heard in the Burkinabe capital for a second day, Traore accused President Paul Henri Demiba of staging a counter-offensive, having been ousted the day before. Traore also claimed Demiba had taken refuge at a French army base. The French Foreign Ministry issued a statement saying the base had never hosted Demiba. But that didn't stop Traore supporters from setting fire to the French embassy's exterior walls. In a statement on Sunday, Traore urged citizens to refrain from acts of violence or vandalism, including against the French embassy or military base. The standoff in the capital signals a deep division within the army and a worrying new chapter for Burkina Faso. The country has been afflicted by a rampant militant insurgency that has undermined faith in the authorities and displaced almost two million people. On Saturday, Demiba made his first statement on the crisis, posting on the official Facebook page of the presidency that Captain Traore and company should come to their senses to avoid a fratricidal war, which Burkina Faso does not need. The United Kingdom is facing a bird flu crisis considered to be the worst in its history. Christmas poultry supplies could be at risk if the flu continues to spread. More than 3 million birds have had to be culled so far, with avian influenza prevention zones introduced in Norfolk, Suffolk, parts of Essex and the whole of southwest of England. There should be 6,000 ducks filling this barn, but there isn't an animal in sight and the feeders are empty. Poultry farmer James has had to cull 20,000 of his ducks just to keep his processing factory free of avian flu. At the moment, everybody in the industry is just on tender hooks constantly. As soon as you get a new batch of birds in on our other site, you're permanently worried. Every day you go and look at them, <coughs> duck sneezes in a slightly different fashion, you're instantly thinking, hang on a minute, is something wrong? The current avian flu outbreak is the largest in UK history. 3.1 million birds have been culled so far. Norfolk, Suffolk, parts of Essex and the whole of the southwest of England have been declared avian influenza prevention zones due to recent outbreaks. Influenza outbreaks have been reported at more than 150 sites across the UK, but much of the devastation has happened away from farms. This wild bird hospital in Mausel had to cull around 200 birds after an outbreak. And conservationists say the effect on the population could be felt for years. We've seen things, declines of between 55 and 80 percent of the population of great skewer in the UK. And we hold two thirds of the world population. So that species has gone straight onto the red list. These birds are long lived. You're talking about birds that don't even start breeding for five years and they may only have one chick. Uh, per year, so it might take decades before some of these populations recover. The government says avian flu poses a low risk to the public and food safety, but poultry farms are being asked to increase biosecurity measures as this outbreak continues to spread. An important claim was made at the Irish Unity Conference held this weekend on a potential unification of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Ireland's Deputy PM told the Irish Unity Conference in Dublin that he shared its dreams but warned against imposing the will of the majority on a pro-UK minority. A shared dream for a shared island. This was the call from Leo Varadka, the Tornishtor, or Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland at a conference to discuss the possible unity of British-run Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. While Vradka shied away from calling for a border poll immediately, he placed more emphasis on forming links across the sectarian divide in the north. There are opposing dreams on this island which cannot be ignored, cannot be wished away, cannot be silenced, nor should they be. Those approaches failed in the past and they will fail in the future. Some, however, were more keen for an immediate border poll. So the question before us is clear, and it is this. Do we remain hemmed in by the narrow boundaries of the past? Republicans who long for a single country on the island of Ireland have the wind in their sails. The pro-unity Sinn Féin are now the largest party in the north. What do you know? 
A fact painfully displayed for unionists when the new King Charles <laughs> greeted Republican representatives before unionist ones. Recent census data also showed that Northern Ireland had more people identifying as Catholic, who are generally Republican-minded, than Protestants, who largely wish to remain part of the UK. But many in Northern Ireland will never accept being a part of the Republic. In the wake of the Queen's death, many Unionists re their loyalty, both to the new King and to the British states. Well, I just think he, he knows we're very loyal to the throne and he'll keep us British forever because we are British. You know, we're, we're British people, we're so proud of him, we're so proud of the Queen, and we're just all broken hearted. Ireland has been divided for a hundred years, with lines that are not easy to bridge. With a changing demography, it will be increasingly important to appeal across differing communities to win the argument on Northern Ireland's future. Elon Musk showcased his humanoid robot Optimus at Tesla's AI Day. Musk said the electric vehicle maker would be ready to take orders for the robot in three to five years. Elon Musk's humanoid robot prototype Optimus made a slow and gingerly entrance onto the stage at Tesla's AI Day, and the billionaire predicted the electric car maker would be able to produce millions of the robots and sell them for less than a third of the price of its Model Y SUV. Our goal is to make um, a, a useful humanoid robot as quickly as possible, and uh, we've also designed it using the same discipline that we use in designing the car, which is to say to, to design it for manufacturing uh, such that it's possible to make the robot at, in, in high volume uh, at low cost. Optimus is designed to be an extremely capable robot, but made in, in very high volume, probably ultimately millions of units, um, and it, it, it is expected to cost much less than a car. I'll just bring so, it directly to the right here. Uh, I would say probably less than $20,000 would be my guess. Musk said he expected Tesla would be ready to take orders for the robot in three to five years, but that more work needed to be done. They're missing a brain. The Tesla CEO described an effort to develop the robots over a decade or more, giving the most detailed vision to date on a business he has said could be bigger than Tesla's electric vehicle revenue. Musk, who has spoken before about the risks of artificial intelligence, said the mass rollout of robots had the potential to, quote, transform civilization. Tesla's push to design and build mass market robots also involves testing them out by working jobs in its factories, setting it apart from other manufacturers that have experimented with humanoid robots. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. British Finance Minister announced the government would reserve a cut to the highest rate of income tax that helped spark turmoil in financial markets and a rebellion in Prime Minister Liz Truss's Conservative Party. It was a humiliating U-turn after less than a month in power. North Korea test-fired two short-range ballistic missiles this weekend. The fourth round this week was of weapons launched that prompted quick, strong condemnation from its rivals. A hospital in Sewan, Pakistan is overwhelmed by those suffering from malaria and other illnesses that are spraying fast after country's worst floods in decades. To help control dengue in Thailand, Japanese cosmetic company Kao produced a new mosquito repellent serum that covers the human skin with the texture mosquitoes loathe. The centre-right GERB, a party blamed for presiding over years of corruption, has won Bulgaria's parliamentary election according to partial results. Officials have counted 99% of ballots from yesterday's poll, which was former Prime Minister's, GERB at 25.4% of the vote. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And as we leave you tonight, we take a look at the Valentino showing off the spring and summer collection at the Paris Fashion Week. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and have a good night.